Hey, everyone. Today's story is a journey through the echoes of regret and the harsh realities of irreversible choices. Grab a seat, brace yourself for the ride, and let's unravel this tale of consequences. My name is Bill Watson. I'm 44 you 5 10 200 pounds in great condition, thanks to regular visits to the gym, and two weekly sessions at the MMA Dojo. My wife Sarah is a liquor at 5 6 110 pounds, and in great condition, thanks to her gym membership, also 44 yo. We have two children Mark 21 yo and Anne 18 yo just went to college a week ago, so we are empty nesters. I work at ABC Engineering as head of research and development. We make the anechoic coatings for submarines. It's my job to make sure our coverings continue to be the best available through rigorous testing at all stages of production. This is a government contract and pays very well indeed. Our house has no mortgage as it was left to me by my grandparents, together with 25 acres of land, and a substantial sum of money. We have money in the bank. Our stocks and shares are worth over a million and a half, and retirement looks to be good. Sarah works part-time at the local hospital as an her nurse, and is good at her job all is as it should be or is it. I'm on my way home from the gym knowing I'm about to be ambushed by my loving wife and her toy boy doctor age 35. How do I know this? My work friend Ralph told me one day in my office. It seems his wife also works at the same hospital. When was I told? Just over six months ago. Ralph came to work at ABC as a computer tech, I have known Ralph since college. I took chemistry and he took computer science, but we both took business management, which is where we met, and we have stayed in touch ever since. When the post of senior computer technician became available I immediately thought of Ralph. I phoned him and said he should apply for the job which he got on my recommendation. It turned out he had married a nurse, Sally, as well. He brought his wife to our Christmas party, and introductions were made. When I introduced Sally to Sarah and mentioned that they worked at the same hospital, Sarah made an excuse and went to another table. Later I saw Ralph and Sally in an intense conversation shortly after they left. That was on a Friday night, Ralph came to see me on Monday morning. He sat opposite me at my desk and looked troubled. I asked him to spit it out and he told me he was sorry, but he thought I should know. Sally worked near at the hospital so rarely saw Sarah, so they weren't friends and didn't socialize. Sally had heard of a nurse in or who was rumored to be having an affair with a young doctor. Sally thought it was just gossip and thought no more of it. Then one day she was talking to another nurse when the nurse pointed out another nurse and said that's the one having the affair, and there's the doctor with her. Sally thought they were acting like a couple holding hands and conversing. She then put it out of her mind until she was asked to take some charts to Dr. Carl Bright. When she got to his office she tapped on the door and got no answer, so tried the door to leave the charts on his desk. The door opened and she was shocked to see Bright sitting on his desk while the nurse who had been pointed out to her was sucking his clock. She quickly shut the door and left asking the desk nurse to give Dr. Bright the charts. Although momentarily shocked she soon put it out of her mind as none of her business and carried on working. Ralph said imagine her surprise when you introduce that same nurse as your wife at the Christmas party. I sat there stunned. My loving wife of over 20 years was having an affair for over a year, and I was the coolest cuckold. I thanked Ralph and asked him to keep it to himself while I tried to figure it out. I knew I would be useless for the rest of the day, so I went home telling my clerical assistant, secretary, where I could be reached. When I got home I sat in my office thinking about what to do next, I had to do something, but what? Perhaps it was just a rumor with no truth. Then I realized I had fallen for the first reaction to devastating news I was in denial. I had to have proof one way or another, so I called the security company that did our background checks. I called Tom Wilson the owner and asked for an appointment. He said he could see me now if I could get there in 20 minutes. I was there in 15 and shown straight in. Okay Bill what can we do for you, I take it it's something personal. I explained the situation to him and asked if he knew any good piss. He explained they had their own investigation and surveillance division, and asked if I wanted to proceed. I agreed and left him a retainer and a photo of Sarah I kept in my wallet. He said I should talk to an attorney as soon as possible, and gave me a card saying to call her. She's a real shark and his sister. I left there feeling a bit better now that I was doing something even if it was as I hoped, a waste of time and money. When I got home it was still some hours before Sarah came home, so I started a little investigation of my own. I first checked her emails on her laptop, I knew her passcode, nothing. I went through her wardrobe no scanty underwear, no CFM shoes, no rubbers nothing out of the ordinary. I would try her phone tonight while she slept. Sarah came and said hi kissed me on the cheek as usual and went for a shower. When I heard the shower running I went into the bedroom to check her panties for evidence, nothing they seemed too clean after a day's hard work. I decided to check the color of her panties before she went to work tomorrow. 
I went back downstairs to start dinner when she came down she asked what sort of day I had. I decided to tweak her and said I had spent the day with Ralph and he had asked us over for dinner one night soon. I watched her carefully as I said this and thought I saw a moment's panic cross her face but she recovered quickly. Saying she wasn't sure she liked Ralph's wife as she was a witch at work so wasn't keen. This alone started alarm bells ringing as I knew she was a very amicable person. The next day I went to work and called in to see my boss and asked for some time off. We weren't very busy at the moment so he agreed but asked why so I explained my problem and he said to take as much time as needed. He had gone through a messy divorce a couple of years ago and I had covered for him through their breakup. He was now married to the counselor who had helped him to restart his life after catching his wife in bed with their neighbor. He gave me her card and said he would tell her to expect a call. I thanked him and went back to my office where I called the attorney Tom had recommended. I got an appointment for that afternoon. When I arrived, I was shown straight in, and she introduced herself as Jane Scott and shook my hand. She said that Tom had spoken to her and asked how she could help, and did I have any proof. I said I was waiting for the PISS report at the end of the month. She explained that she could still file for divorce citing irreconcilable differences, but proof of adultery would give me a stronger case. I agreed she should prepare the paperwork based purely on what Ralph had told me Sally had seen. She then gave me a list of things I could do to mitigate my financial loss. She also warned me not to do anything stupid or to try to hide any assets from her attorney. She said it would be a 50-50 split, but as I earned much more than her, she would get spousal support for the rest of her life. Which meant I would be paying her to duck other men, no way Jose. I told Jane to hold off until I had sorted some things out, and I would contact her. Having sex with Sarah wasn't a problem. She had cut me off about a year ago saying she was dry, and it was painful. I suggested using lube, but she said it was more than that she no longer felt interested in sex, but would help me out with hand and blue jobs. This all made sense now that I know she was having an affair at work. The hand and mouth relief became less often and then only when I asked for it. One morning I cuddled up to her with a stiffy rubbing against her back she shot out of bed screaming. That's all you ever think about sex, sex, sex you're a ducking pervert now leave me alone. And she went into the bathroom slamming the door. That afternoon I moved all my stuff into the guest room, and I haven't been in the master bedroom since. That was six months ago needless to say my right hand is getting a workout at least twice a week. The funny thing is after about a month I found I didn't miss sex with Sarah anymore the temptation was missing, so I felt no rejection. Our relationship improved at the same time I made this discovery, and we became roommates rather than husband and wife. I once asked our doctor about our situation, and he said it was quite normal for a woman of her age to go off sex, but her sex drive would probably return in time. I love her so much, so I decided to wait and be as supportive as possible. Now all the above makes sense what a chump I've been well, no more the gloves come off. A month later Tom asks me to come to his office, so the piss report is ready. As soon as I see Tom I know it's going to be bad, Tom tells me to take a seat he then looks at me as he seems to come to a decision. Bill you are right we have audio, photos and video proving her affair with Carl Bright. If there is any possibility of a reconciliation I recommend you do not look at the photos or video they are pretty graphic. Tom the moment she kissed another man we were through show me what you've got. He first showed me the photos which almost made me puke. The first one showed Sarah with Carl's cock in her mouth and then with it up her peach and the last one showed him cooming over her rings while she laughed. At that point I broke down and cried, Tom left me for a while and then came back with a cup of coffee. I thanked him and took a big swig. Bill are you sure you want to see the rest the video is much worse and the audio will break your heart or I can sum up the two and you can look at them later. I didn't think I could take much more so I asked for a copy to view later and asked him to give me the reader's digest version of the report. Basically, they've been screwing ever since he joined the hospital. Sometimes in his office and other times at the Silver Dollar Motel. Shortly after they started their affair he demanded she cut you off then a few months later he told her to not give you any relief at all. They did this to try and force you to start your own affair so that she could divorce you and clean you out. You're being followed and your house might even be bugged and you might also want to check your car. We can do all that if you would like us to. All we need is the keys to your house and car, we can do your car now if you wish. I handed over my keys and he called a colleague to take the keys. I asked if he could find out who was following me, and he made a couple of calls. It turned out it was one of his rivals, so he told me how to spot the tail and what to do about it. The man he had given the keys to came back and said the car was clean, we then made an appointment for them to visit my home to scan for bugs and cameras. When I got home I called Ralph and asked to meet him at the Lone Ranch Bar and Grill, he said he would be there at 6. Sarah wouldn't be home until 7.30, so I had plenty of time. 
When I got there he was waiting for me in a secluded booth with two beers waiting. Okay, Bill what's so important that it can't wait until tomorrow? I explained my meeting with Tom and said I wondered if my home computer, laptop and phone were safe to use, so I called him. Doug build that sheet sure I'll take a look I've got the tools in the car let's go back to your place. When we got there I motioned him to be quiet and we went into my office. He took out a small black box about the size of a TV controller. He put his finger to his lips for me to keep silent and walked around the room waving it about. Suddenly there was a loud beep as he waved it over a picture. He reached behind the picture and showed me a small microphone. He went back to his toolbox and produced a small cube which he put on the desk and pressed a button. Okay we can talk now I neutralized the mic and there doesn't seem to be any other devices in here. Do you want me to destroy it? I thought about it for a minute. No, but can I have one of those pointing to the cube? I don't want her to know I've found out about her putting surveillance on me just yet, and I can use that to feed her false information. Will the people who put that in here know we found it? No, it will just look like there was nothing to record. Now let's check your other appliances. He found a keystroke logger on both my desktop and laptop computers. We left the one on the desktop so as not to alert anyone to me knowing it was there. I had a plan to disable her logger on my laptop. The phone was found to be clean, so no action was needed. That night we watched TV for a while, and she said she was tired and was going to bed. She went to kiss me, but I turned my head, and she kissed my cheek. She stood there looking uncertain and said, I love you, baby. I replied that's nice, I've got work to do so good night. The next day I bought new hard drives for my laptop and desktop computers, and had them fitted by Ralph, who transferred everything over to the new drives. I kept the old drives in my safe at work for future reference. At dinner that night Sarah was quiet just answering me when necessary. I wanted to put her on edge, so I started a conversation. A funny thing happened today. I noticed my laptop was running slowly, so I asked Ralph to look over it. Ralph found a virus that was recording my keystrokes, so he changed the hard drive to a new one. As you know my laptop is supplied by the company, and as we work with sensitive government projects, it was classed as a security breach. We reported it to security who sent the drive to the FBI for examination. If they discover who put the virus on the drive they could spend the next 25 years in federal prison for treason. Sarah dropped her knife and fork and ran to the bathroom, and I could hear her throwing up. I had a little chuckle to myself, the drives were safely in my safe at work, but it gave me an idea about informing the FBI later. When she returned her face was a whiter shade of pale, I pretended not to notice. Are you okay Sarah you don't look too well. Just went down the wrong hole that's all. Well, as I was saying, I keep a lot of information on my desktop, so I also changed that drive. I also checked my phone, but that was clean. The head of security said that the FBI would also want to do a sweep of our house and cars sometime soon. Sarah went even whiter if that was possible and didn't answer me. I bet all the surveillance gear they installed will be removed by the end of the week. I would love to be a fly on the wall when she tells her boyfriend he may go to prison. I needed a plan to minimize my financial exposure when we divorced without ending up in prison, I needed time to put the plan into action. I needed her to keep seeing the asshole while I implemented my plan, I needed at least 6 months. Sarah went to bed early again, good I can hardly stand to be in the same room with her anymore. So, I went into my office and sat at my desk formulating a plan of action. 3 hours later I had what I thought was a workable plan. I slept well that night. The next morning, I went to see my boss Frank and told him what was going on. He said he would help in any way he could, having suffered a messy divorce a couple of years ago. I laid out the first part of my plan that he would let me go as things were tied at the moment. He said he couldn't let me go completely as my work was critical to the company's ongoing success. But I could work as a consultant from home, and therefore would not be classed as employed. I will be officially unemployed from next Monday. Next, I contacted Tom and asked if he could put audio surveillance in all the rooms at home, and also in Carl Bright's office. He said that wouldn't be a problem, but I couldn't use the take from the office in court. I said it was just to gather information, so he agreed and sent a man around that afternoon. I was surprised it only took him half an hour, so I asked what he had done. He had replaced the plug sockets with ones with the mic attached, they worked just the same and looked identical. The feed went to my laptop and phone and then to the cloud for storage. I could even access it live when any noise was detected it would call my phone to let me know it was active and I could listen in. He said he had also wired my landline so that I could hear both ends of the conversation. I asked if he could do the same with her cell phone and he gave me a little flat circuit board and showed me how to fit it to her phone. He then asked if I paid for her cell and I said I did. 
He said I could use the taking cord in that case, as it was legally my phone. That night I told Sarah I had been fired, but would soon find another job. She didn't seem happy about that so I said to look on the bright side I would be home most of the time, and we could spend more time together. She looked positively pissed at that. I gathered that from her reaction I had just put a major crimp in her sex life, I had a little chuckle at that inside myself. Sarah came into the lounge that night after dinner dressed in a see-through nightie and nothing else. She sat down opposite me with her legs open showing me her shave kitty. She looked at me and smiled. Baby it's been a long time how about an early night? No thanks, there's a game on later I'm going to watch that. Good night. And I went into my office and shut the door, I heard her gasp and run up the stairs, I even thought I heard her crying. Good now she knows how I felt when she cut me off. But I had to wonder what she was trying to accomplish as she was getting all the sex she needed from Carl the Sheethead. I did watch the game with a couple of beers. That night I waited for her to go to sleep, and I could hear her gently snoring. I crept into her bedroom and took her phone to put the listening device that Tom's guy had given to me into it, then put her phone back on her charger and went back to bed. The next morning, I was up at 6 and went for my morning run. As I ran my phone chirped letting me know she was making a call in my absence. I stopped to listen in. Hi Carl, he's out for his run did you get all of that stuff out of the house? You got it out yesterday while he was out, do you think he suspects? I don't know I tried to get him to duck me last night, and he turned me down flat the bustard said he would sooner watch the game. Have you heard anything about the hard drive he sent to the FBI, I'm really worried about that. No nothing yet do you think they could trace it back to us? Don't know, but if they do we could be in a lot of trouble. Why don't I just divorce him now, I'll still get half of everything, and we can get married I might even get the house. Not yet we need to wait until after his 45th birthday, so that we can get his inheritance as well. Are we still on for this afternoon? Okay you're right of course and yes the usual place, I can't wait to get your clock in me and suck you off. Me too, see you then bye. Bye. I put my phone in my pocket and continued my run. I now knew why Carl the Sheet was interested in Sarah. When my uncle died having no children he left the house to me, and a substantial sum of money was to be paid to me on my 45th birthday. But it had one stipulation. Sarah and I had to sign a prenup to the effect that if either of us cheated the guilty party would get nothing. This also explained why they wanted me to start an affair, so that she would get everything. I would end up living in a shitty apartment eating beans on toast. When I got home Sarah had gone to work so I sent my attorney, Jane, a copy of her conversation with Carl. That night I told Sarah I had to go to Washington for a couple of job interviews, and would be away for a few days. She pretended to be upset at me going away, but I could see in her eyes she was pleased. The next morning, I was up early again and taking my run when my phone chirped, once again Sarah was talking to Carl the Sheet. He's going away for a few days why don't you come and stay while he's away, then you can duck me in his bed like you always wanted. Great when's he going? Tomorrow you can come over after work I'll cook you something nice before the main event. Little giggle. Okay see you at work tomorrow bye. The more I thought about Dr. Sheethead the more I hated him. I called Tom and asked him to do a full deep background on Dr. Sheethead. I also asked him to tip off the FBI that I was being followed and would they take action on my way to the airport tomorrow. I then gave him the description and license plate of the car. We both knew it was the pie my wife hired but the FBI didn't. As I was engaged in sensitive national security projects, I was considered a likely target for foreign agents to abduct. The next day I was up and gone before Sarah and on the way to the airport, I saw my tail latch onto me just before I hit the freeway. As I took the airport exit three cars blocked him off and pulled him from his car. I saw all this in my rear view mirror. I was in a really good mood for the rest of my journey. I of course never went to Washington. I was going to Las Vegas to lose some money. A lot of money. I booked into a fairly plush hotel for three days and went to one of the smaller casinos to lose some money. I went to one of the cash desks for some chips. I bought $100k of chips with my joint debit card $20k were of small donation chips, mostly $100 chips. For the rest of the night, I went around the casino making small bets. At the end of the evening, I was $15k down, I went to a different desk and cashed in my chips for a cashier's check, then went to bed. The next night I repeated my actions at a different casino and again the next night. Before I check out I opened a numbered account at a bank in the Cayman Islands and posted the checks worth $270k by recorded delivery and went home. When I arrived home I looked at the stored evidence on my computer and it was clear that Dr. Sheet had it stayed at my home for the last three days. Judging from the conversations and all the moaning and duck me's recorded a good time was had by all. 
I sent the evidence to Jane for safekeeping. The next few weeks went much as before with a few exceptions. I made frequent visits to Vegas with similar results. I now had almost $800k in my offshore account. I had requested a meeting with the administrators of my trust, and after showing them my evidence they agreed to my proposal. The trust would be deferred for another two years, so it wouldn't come to me until I was 47. I still had nearly $1 million to hide. I looked up the symptoms of depression on my laptop. I then made an appointment with my doctor. He asked me what was wrong, and I gave him a list of my symptoms. He said it sounded like I was depressed and asked if there was any reason for my depression. I explained that my wife was cheating on me, and he sympathized and prescribed anti-depression drugs. I left looking broken but feeling elated. The next thing I did was to cash out my 401 and all or investments. I started playing the stock market and losing heavily, at the same time I opened an account with a British bank and started trading from there. I had played the market before earning a reasonable return, I was far more aggressive now and was doing quite well. As no money was showing in the US, there was no obvious trail to follow, and no tax to be paid in the US. I sashed another $600k in the UK, then moved it around a bit ending up in the Cayman account. Our total net worth was now less than $500k on paper. I kept $50k in our joint account and the rest in our savings account. So instead of her receiving over a million dollars, she would only get at best $250k, and I could live with that. My birthday was in two weeks, and I should have come into my inheritance, but that wouldn't happen for another two years. She of course didn't know that and was ready to spring her surprise on me. As my birthday approached I asked my friends out to dinner. Ralph and Sally, Tom Wilson and his wife Claire, my attorney Jane who has no partner and my boss Frank with no partner. The big day arrived, and Sarah gave me my card before she went to work, it just said happy birthday and was just signed by Sarah. There was no verse no love you, it was just a generic card, not even it to my husband. I of course got other cards from my children and relatives. I even got a, to her wonderful son-in-law card with a gift voucher. That evening when Sarah got home I was in the shower getting ready for my night out. Sarah was in the kitchen when I came downstairs dressed to go out she looked at me with a confused expression. Baby you didn't tell me we were going out I'll just grab a quick shower and throw something on it won't take me long. Don't bother I'm going out you do whatever you do when I'm not here. Why don't you call your boyfriend and go out with him? You know you would prefer to spend time with him rather than me. I said this as I opened the door to leave. What are you talking about there's nobody but you, I love only you I would never cheat on you. Whatever. And I closed the door behind me. I got to the restaurant early so I sat in my car and looked to see what she had done after I left. She had wasted no time in contacting Dr. Sheethead. Hi Carl, I think Bill suspects something. He just went out dressed to the nines to celebrate his birthday, and accused me of cheating. I don't know how much he knows, but I'm worried. Well, it doesn't matter now does it? He came into his inheritance today so it's time you dumped him and cleaned him out. Give it a week, and then we confront him with the divorce papers. Sounds like a plan and after the divorce we can get married and move into his house. I sat there for a moment thinking what a stupid witch he will never marry you he just wants my money. I had to laugh. They thought they were so clever they had no idea what a sheath storm they were walking into. The seven of us sat at the table and I had an announcement to make. First I would like to thank you all for helping me celebrate my birthday, and for being there as my friends in this difficult time. Some of you I have only recently met, but I feel you are more of a friend than my wife. Having said this, I declare this a non-business meeting of friends. There will be no further mention of my marital problems tonight. Please just enjoy yourselves. Now let's order. The rest of the evening went off well, Jane and Frank being the only single people there gravitated together, and seemed to enjoy each other's company. I wondered if there might be something there, I hope so for both their sakes. When I got home Sarah was in bed, so I tried not to make a noise as I crept up to my room. I slept soundly that night with no dreams of her infidelity and betrayal. The next morning Sarah had already gone to work when I got up. When I went downstairs I saw Sarah had put my birthday cards on the mantel. I immediately put hers in the bin. Yes I know it was petty, so sue me, I went for my usual run, then spent some time playing the European stock markets. I realized I was hungry at about 2.30 so went to the local deli for lunch. I took my laptop with me to monitor my morning's work. By the end of the day, I had increased my fortune by $20k, which started its journey to my numbered account via half a dozen banks. After lunch, I went for a walk in the park and watched the children play. Unfortunately, this brought back happier times when Sarah and I would watch our children play, and I could feel hot tears running down my face. As I sat there a woman sat next to me and put her hand on mine. 
I immediately felt a little better knowing someone actually cared. I looked at this woman, she was about my age, well dressed and obviously looked after herself. When I asked her why she had held my hand she replied she thought I needed it. We sat there for some time not talking, just being this close to someone who cared was soothing. I asked her if she would like some coffee. She declined but said there was a nice tea shop round the corner, and she preferred tea. We walked to the tea shop hand in hand like we had known each other all our lives. When we sat down she insisted on ordering a pot of herbal tea for two and two scones with jelly and cream. While we waited she told me her name was Wendy. She had moved to the US from England several years ago with her husband, who had died two years ago from cancer. Our tea arrived and we were silent as we ate our delicious scones. As we drank our tea which was surprisingly better than I had expected. She slowly pried my story for me as I looked down at the table to hide my tears. As I started to apologize for my lack of control I noticed she was also crying, so I reached across the table and held her hand. We stared at each other for a while and then started to laugh. She asked if I would like to go to her apartment and continue to get to know each other a little better. It then occurred to me that this might be a setup by my wife. So, I showed her my ring and said I don't cheat. She laughed and said she wasn't interested in a romantic relationship and just needed a friend and thought I did too. We went to her apartment which was just a block away and overlooked the park. I was surprised when the doorman of a high class building recognized Wendy and held the door open for us to enter. I was further surprised when she walked past the elevators to a key operated elevator that led to the penthouse suite. She inserted her key and the door opened, we arrived at the penthouse, and as we left the elevator an attractive young woman appeared. Welcome home madam did you enjoy your walk? Yes, indeed Ellie this is Mr. Watson would you take him into the lounge and get him a coffee while I change? The maid walked away with me following I wondered if I'd fallen down the rabbit hole. Like Alice in Wonderland, as I sat waiting and drinking my coffee, I pondered what she would change into. When she left she was wearing a conservative dress ending below the knees, 3 inch high heels, and carrying what looked like an expensive purse. She looked to all the world like a businesswoman going to lunch. When she returned she was wearing denims with a pullover and sensible shoes with a 2 inch heel. She had also put her hair in a ponytail she looked 10 years younger. She sat opposite me and smiled. Now we look like a couple instead of a rich aunt with her nephew. I then realized I wore denim jeans, cowboy boots, and a check shirt. She was right, we now look like we belong together, and I had to laugh. She sipped her coffee and looked at me over the lip of her china cup. So now we look the part where are you taking me for dinner, not a restaurant, please. I hadn't thought about it, how about a western style bar and eatery, I know a good one not far out of town. Excellent, I grab a jacket it might get cold later. As we left she called out to Ellie. You might as well take the rest of the day off I won't be home till late and we left. We walked back to the park where I had left the car. I beat the remote and the indicators flashed. As we drove to the out of town grill Wendy remarked nice wheels. I drove a 5 year old Volvo XC90. It was indeed a nice car. Sarah of course drove a 2 year old BMW Sport Coupe. It was a lease car so that she could change it every 3 years. We arrived at the ranch house grill and went inside. There were a few empty booths as it was still early. We picked one at random and sat down, a tired looking waitress sauntered over wearing an almost identical outfit to me, but with a Stetson on. She dropped two menus and asked what we wanted to drink. Wendy ordered a beer and I ordered a non-alcohol beer. We sat reading our menus until the drinks were brought and ordered the same thing. A rare 10 ounces steak with fries and a salad. As we waited a band started to set up on the small stage and tune up. The meal arrived 20 minutes later, just as the band started playing a western ballad. A few couples started to sway across the floor in time with the music. We finished our meal and ordered another round of drinks after they arrived Wendy asked me to dance, and I accepted. We shuffled around for two songs and sat back down. I was just about to take a swallow of my beer when a hand was laid on my shoulder, when I looked to see who the hand belonged to, I saw a man about 6'3 standing there. Hey mister you want to move that's my seat you're sitting in, and he squeezed my shoulder. The waitress came over. Clive I've told you before you don't own this booth there are plenty more empty booths so why not sit in one of them. Mind your own business B. I like this booth and him and his whore are gonna move ain't that right mister. A waitress B grabbed his arm and tried to move him away but he turned and gave her a shove. She took a couple of steps backwards, tripped over a chair leg and fell hitting her head. I stood up and tapped him on the shoulder. Hey big mouth how about you tried that on a man instead of a woman less than half your size. He turned to face me. I would if there was a man in here you don't qualify short stuff. I looked meaningfully at the security camera and said. Let's you and I take this outside. I then walk out the door, he had to follow, or he would have looked ridiculous in front of his friends. 
As he left he looked at Wendy and said. Back soon sweet cheeks then you and I are gonna have some fun if you know what I mean. And he pushed his groin towards her several times. I stood in a half empty parking space noticing the security camera mounted on the wall. When he came out with his supporters in tow, I extended my hand palm up and crooked my fingers. Come to me, he stood there laughing at me and said when I'm done with you, I'm gonna duck your whore till she can't stand up. I just smiled at him. Okay, big boy as you have all the mouth you can take the first shot. He turned to his followers as if he were going to speak, then spun around trying to deliver a crushing roundhouse punch. I easily ducked under his arm, stepped forward, grabbed his collar and kicked him in the back of the knee. He went down howling I then dropped and kneed him in the stomach he rolled into a ball and threw up. I knew he was finished, and so did his friends who looked shocked at their hero's demise. The whole episode had taken less than two minutes. I walked back in dusted my jeans and apologized to everyone for disturbing their night out. For which I got a round of applause and some cheers. The waitress was all right and up again, but someone had dialed 911 and asked for the police and an ambulance, thinking I would need one. About 10 minutes later a patrol car pulled into the parking lot and two officers entered. They took statements from everyone and asked if B was okay when she said she was they cancelled the ambulance took a copy of the security cameras and left. I never had to buy a drink all night. After the police left the band started playing line dancing music and Wendy and I were dragged up and taught how to line dance. We called it a night at about 11pm and I took Wendy home there was much handshaking and demands that we return as we left. I pulled up outside Wendy's apartment block and said I hadn't had such a good time in years. She said the same and gave me a peck on the cheek saying. I hope to see you again soon please call me and she gave me her card with her name address and phone numbers on it. I drove home feeling better than I had in years and found myself humming one of the lion dancing tunes. When I got home I realized I hadn't thought about Sarah all night and now that I did I didn't care. I opened the door and saw Sarah sitting in the lounge, she almost shouted. And what ducking time do you call this? I looked at my watch and replied. Just after 12 has your watch stopped. I thought her head might explode she went so red. You thoughtless bustard I've been worried sick about you where have you been? Well, when the only reason you waited up is because you have no work tomorrow well today actually. And two where I've been is none of your business, like you told me when I asked that same question you don't owe me. I then walked upstairs to bed leaving her doing a fish out of water impression. The next morning, I was up first and out running I usually run to the park do a lap and run back. When I got to the park I stopped and called Wendy. Hi, Bill I hope you would call where are you? I'm at the park during my morning run, I just wanted to thank you for the best night out I can remember. We're in the park are you we could grab a coffee if you like. On the bench by the pond and yes I would love to grab a coffee. See you in 10, bye. 15 minutes later she sat next to me after giving me a peck on the cheek. We walked to the deli on the corner and grabbed a couple of takeaways and went back to the bench. We sat there for a few minutes sipping our coffee without speaking. Then both together started to talk, we stopped and laughed, and I said she should go first. Bill about yesterday, I don't want you to think I'm in the habit of picking up men at the park. It was just that you look so down, and I was afraid you might do something stupid. Oh, so you just felt sorry for me, was yesterday just about pity, is that why you agreed to come out with me to dinner? Oh god no at first I was just concerned for you, but as we sat talking I realized we had made a connection, at least I hope we have. I'm pleased you feel the same way as I do. I was afraid I had made a fool of myself, you see I think I have feelings for you. I can't act on them while I'm still married. I hope you understand. If I did I would be no better than she is, and I won't sink that low. Bill I feel the same way, I can wait until you're ready, but in the meantime, we can get to know each other a bit better and see where that leads us. That sounds good to me, I'd better go now. Can I give you a call when next I come by? I run here nearly every day, and it would give me something to look forward to. That sounds great I look forward to hearing from you soon. I think there was a spring in my steps as I finished my run. When I got home Sarah was cooking breakfast, I went straight upstairs for a shower, and got changed into my bumming about clothes. Did you have a good run you're later than usual? Same old same old, what's for breakfast? I wasn't sure when you would be back, so I didn't cook you anything. No problem I'll just pop down to Denny's see you later. I was still humming when I got into Denny's where I had a light breakfast of bacon, eggs and toast, followed by two cups of strong black coffee. When I got home Sarah was out. On a hunch, I drove past Dr. Sheethead's house, and as expected her BMW was parked outside, I took a photo and went home. I was clearing the yard when Sarah got home some three hours later. I knew she wanted me to ask her where she'd been so that she could start a fight, so I didn't. 
Instead, I asked her if she had a good afternoon and went back to work without waiting for an answer. I knew this pissed her off and started to hum one of the lying dancing tunes I was beginning to enjoy. When I finished in the yard I went into my office and shut the door. I brought up the latest conversations between Sarah and Dr. Sheethead, it was the usual disrespect for me, and looking forward to their next tryst. So, nothing new I forwarded them to Jane is a matter of course. For the next two weeks, I met Wendy for coffee every time I went for a run, and on the night Sarah was seeing her girlfriends, we went line dancing. I didn't get home on those nights until after midnight, but Sarah never said anything and never stayed up. I was now enjoying myself and the people I interacted with noticed my new happiness. I had to go and see Frank about a new formula being tried out, and when he saw it different me his only comment was be careful. When I met up with Jane she also noticed my newfound happiness, and asked if I had started an affair of my own. I explained about Wendy, and she said not to cross the line until after the divorce. She also asked what Wendy's last name was, and when I said Richards there was a sharp intake of breath. When I asked if Jane knew her she said Wendy Richards was one of the wealthiest women in the US, with business dealings in a variety of enterprises. She was also known to give generously to deserving charities, one of which was the hospital where Sarah worked. Sir, shortly after her fight with Bill. I was floating on cloud nine on my way home from the motel. There were no procedures scheduled for this afternoon. Carl and I had spent the afternoon ducking each other's brains out. Carl seemed to be able to go on forever with only a very short recovery time, whereas Bill was one and done with a two hour recovery time. Although I had to admit Bill's lovemaking was more satisfying and lasted longer, Carl just stuck me into the mattress and treated me like a whore. When I got home Bill's car was missing and there was no smell of cooking. I looked for a note, but there wasn't one. At first, I was a little pissed, but then thought he would be home soon and take me out to dinner, so I showered and dressed ready to go out. When Bill still hadn't got home by 7 I called his cell. It went straight to voicemail, by 9 I had given up all hope of going out. I went into the kitchen to make an omelette and noticed the card I had bought him from the gas station was in the bin. I looked but all the other cards were on display it was obvious I had just bought the first card I saw with no thought at all. It was the first time since I started the affair that I felt guilty. Bill had always bought me such loving cards with beautiful words and a special present. I had bought him nothing but disrespect and he had shown his contempt by throwing my card away. A small tear ran down my face. What had I turned into? When Bill finally came home he seemed in a better mood than I had seen him in for months. When I shouted at him he quickly shot me down, citing my own words back at me. He then went to bed humming some tune I vaguely remembered. I sat there stunned. He had never shouted at me in all the years we were married. Had I created a monster? The next morning Bill had already gone on his run when I got up, so I waited until the usual time of his return. When he didn't show up I cooked breakfast for one, so he could get his own ducking breakfast. When Bill got in he asked what was for breakfast, and I told him I had only cooked for myself, instead of being pissed he just went to Denny's for breakfast. I thought duck you, Bill and called Carl. He wasn't expecting my call as we don't usually get together on my days off. I asked if he wanted some company and of course he did, and I went over there for the next 3 hours and ducked Carl's brains out. When I got home Bill was in the backyard doing yard work whatever that is. I expected him to ask where I'd been. I was ready to rip into him, but he just asked if I had a good morning. He didn't even wait for a reply, he just carried on working. It seemed as if he just didn't care. I was a little hurt that my husband didn't care what I had been doing or where I'd been. When he finished in the yard he locked himself in his office still humming that same ducking tune. The next day Bill was up and out before me again, I hardly ever see him anymore, he's either running at the gym or the damn dojo. I must admit though he sure looks ripped and fit. In fact, he looks in better shape than Carl. After our morning procedures were done Carl and I had our usual session in his office. Afterwards, we sat talking about Bill's change in attitude and decided to drop the boom on him this Friday after work. Carl and I would be waiting for him when he came in from the gym. Bill. So, there I was coming home from the gym and about to be ambushed by my loving wife and her toy boy. Unfortunately for them, I knew all about their plans to ambush me, thanks to the bug the pie had planted in his office. Yes I know it's inadmissible in court, but that wasn't the point anyway. They had a rude awakening coming. I had nearly a week to set them up and I was looking forward to this confrontation. I pulled into my garage and went into the house, and there in the lounge was my slot of a wife sitting on the sofa with Dr. Sheethead. I barely glanced at them and went into the kitchen to drop my gym bag. I grabbed a beer and went into the lounge and sat opposite them. They looked a bit bemused at my actions then looked at each other, and Sarah started. Bill we need to talk. I sat there silently until Sarah couldn't stand the silence any longer. Bill I said we need to talk. 
Okay, so talk. Sarah looked at Dr. Sheethead and continued. I'm sorry, Bill, but I've been seeing Carl for over a year, and we've fallen in love and want to get married, so I want a divorce. Okay, just give me the address of your attorney, and my attorney will be in touch as it is. Sarah looked at me dumbfounded, her lips moved but nothing came out. Finally, she found her voice. Is that all you've got to say don't you have any questions? Not really, I think I have all the answers I need, but just to be sure let me recap. You and Dr. Bright of 243 Spruce Drive have been having an affair behind my back for over a year. You duck in his office every day at work and sometimes at the Silver Dollar Motel, and lastly in my house in the matrimonial bed. Have I left anything out? They both looked absolutely stricken and I had so much information on them. Sir, I heard you and Scumbag discussing how you were going to divorce me and clean me out. Well, it's not going to work out quite as you thought it would. Now she'd had get out of my house before I throw you out. You have no right to throw him out I invited him, and it's my house too. Once again you have underestimated me. This house was given to me by my grandparents before we met so it's not communal property. So once again and for the last time get the duck out of my house, you slimy piece of shit. He still didn't move so I picked up my phone and dialed 911. Emergency services, what is your emergency? In all honesty, it's not an emergency yet, but there is a man in my home who refuses to leave, and I am about to throw him out. Please sir don't do anything yet there is a patrol car on its way, please keep this line open. I sat there smiling at them waiting for the police to arrive. After about 15 minutes a patrol car pulled up outside, and two officers came to the door and knocked. I shouted for them to come in and they did with their hands on their guns. I explained the situation and even showed them the recording of our confrontation. They asked to see proof of my singular ownership which I showed them. Satisfied with my evidence they told she'd had to leave which she did. I went to the window and watched him get into his car. He didn't drive away, he just sat there. The officers then asked me if I wanted my wife to leave, and I said not yet. I again dialed a number on my phone and said just one word now. Shortly afterwards there was a knock on the door, and a man in a grey suit walked over to Sarah, and asked if she was Sarah Watson. She said yes she was, and he handed her an envelope and said. You have been served and left. She looked at me with tears streaming down her face. I looked back at her and said. Why are you crying, isn't this what you wanted? That's what you said, I have it recorded. Now while well, these nice police officers are here go and pack your bags, you have 15 minutes to get out. She almost ran up the stairs, and I noticed the two officers were grinning at each other. Fifteen minutes later they were escorting her out of the house, but not before I removed her rings and gave her mine. When you're ready to collect the rest of your stuff contact my attorney. And I gave her Jane's card. She turned and looked at me as I slammed the door in her face. The next day I had all the locks changed. I did the usual things cancel joint credit cards, but I did leave the joint savings account open. I didn't know how much Sarah had in her account, but I had less than $5k in my account and $500k in our joint account. I put $100k in the children's education fund, and their future education was safe with the amount already in there. That left $400k from which either of us could draw funds. I then changed my life policy beneficiary to the children and removed Sarah from my health insurance plan. Sarah's attorney did contact mine and at a meeting, it was agreed to split our communal assets 50 50s when the assets were disclosed as only $400k Sarah went ballistic, claiming our assets were at least $3 mil. When shown the account details she said I had hidden the rest and would see me in court, the meeting then broke up. When our case came to court my wife was claiming $1.5 million in assets, the house and land and half of my inheritance. She also wanted spousal support. She had a very self-satisfied look on her face as she sat looking at me. Jane stood and addressed the judge. Your Honor it's true that Mr. and Mrs. Watson did have assets to the value of some $3 million 13 months ago, when Mrs. Watson started her affair with Dr. Bright. When Mr. Watson found out about her affair he went into a deep depression and was prescribed diazepam a powerful antidepressant. She then handed some paperwork to the court bailiff to give to the judge. As you can see Your Honor there is a deposition from his doctor testifying to the fact. His depression was so severe that he started making mistakes at work and got fired and has not worked since. Then quite out of character, he started gambling and lost most of their money at various casinos in Las Vegas. You will see in the paperwork you have receipts from the cash desks about the fact. After losing nearly all their money at the gaming tables he started to realize what he was doing and stopped gambling. But he felt he needed to replace the lost funds, so he cashed in his 401 and all their investments and savings bonds, except the children's education fund. 
He had had some success in trading on the stock market in the past, so he tried to recoup the losses that way. Unfortunately, he lost more than he gained, and when he finally stopped trading he was down to the last dollar 500k. He put dollar 100k in the children's education fund, and has agreed to split the rest 50 50ths with his wife some dollar 400k. As to his inheritance, he contacted the trustees, and they decided that in his present state of mind, he could not be trusted with the money, so they deferred it for a further two years. Which means it is not counted as a communal asset. The house they presently live in, and the surrounding land were gifted to him by his grandparents before he met his wife, so it is also not communal property. I would also like to present a counterclaim for spousal support as Mr. Watson is unemployed, and Mrs. Watson is still lucratively employed. The judge listened to Jane and adjourned the hearing until he could go through the paperwork Jane had given him. Sarah looked as if someone had punched her in the gut, Carl was nowhere to be seen. They had still not heard from the judge after a week, so I had the next part of my plan initiated. Sarah and Carl and her attorney were invited to a meeting with me at Jane's offices. At first, they didn't want to come, but when they were advised that I still had evidence the FBI would be interested in they relented. I was sitting on a straight-back chair in the corner of Jane's office when her secretary showed them in. As they sat on the sofa a deputy sheriff and a man in a suit came in behind them. Sarah and Chief for Brains looked at each other in alarm. I started the meeting. First I would like to thank you all for attending this meeting. I would like to introduce the two gentlemen to both of you, the one in uniform is a deputy sheriff, and the other gentleman is assistant DA Lawrence. The purpose of their presence will become obvious in due course. We will also be joined by four other women via Zoom in a little while. Dr. Bright, is it true that you started an affair with my wife just over a year ago? Is that why we are here? That will become apparent shortly. Is it true that you told my wife that you are single and wanted to marry her? Of course, I love her what's this about? Okay, it's time we zoomed with our other guests. I turned on the 24-inch TV that was already connected to the internet. It was divided into six squares. The first two showed two women about five years older than my wife. The third square was blank, but the other four showed women slightly older than my wife. They all looked extremely pissed. Under each, there was a name Jenkins, Adams, Farley, Grant, Mason and Grimes. I'm sure you recognize these women Dr. Bright Aka Jenkins, Adams, Farley, Grant, Mason and Grimes. Those are the names you married them under and cleared out their accounts and left to start again in another state. You graduated in the top 10 of your medical school and are a gifted surgeon. In your time as a student, you soon found you could seduce older women with your charm and good looks. You would seduce an older woman with a rich husband and claim poverty, and she of course would pay to keep you in luxuries. When you started as a young surgeon in your first hospital you targeted older nurses with wealthy husbands. You seduced them and encouraged them to divorce their husbands and marry you. You would then steal their divorce settlements, sometimes millions of dollars. You would then disappear only to reappear a couple of years later in a different state with a different name. That you had stolen from the medical registry, it wasn't difficult to get false papers to attest your surgeon's skills, and then you would start again. I looked at the screen and asked the woman if this was the man they married, they all replied yes and started screaming obscenities at him. Dr. Sheethead was looking rather ill by now, and Sarah was sobbing on the floor having moved when reality set in. You may have noticed that the third square Mrs. Farley is blank, that is because Mrs. Farley was found buried at the back of the home she shared with the man now calling himself Dr. Bright. Well, Dr. Jenkins, that is your real name isn't it? The DA of that particular county would like a word with you about a murder. I looked at the deputy sheriff and nodded. He moved towards Dr. Sheethead and read him his rights, then handcuffed him and led him away. The DA looked at Sarah and said he would like to talk to her about Dr. Bride and make an appointment. Sarah looked at me and said. I'm so sorry I replied. Yes you are. And walked out. I was notified of the court appearance to decide the judge's ruling on the disposition of our finances. I sat in the court waiting for the judge to come to our case. I noticed Sarah was sitting looking at her hands and fidgeting a sure sign she was nervous. The judge dismissed the case in front of him and announced the next case. In the case of Watson v. Watson, I will now announce my findings. Will both parties please rise? I have deliberated over the evidence before me for some time, as this is a far from straightforward case. On one hand, I see a wife who deliberately cluckled her husband for over a year with her lover, and attempted to use the courts to take half of his wealth. I do not approve of using our judicial system to steal from your spouse. You also kept a separate account which you didn't disclose to the court, for that you will receive 30 days for contempt of court. Sarah gasped and slumped into her chair. The judge continued. 
On the other hand, we have a loving husband who having found out about her affair, goes into a deep depression, loses his job, and gambles most of their wealth away. The judge looks directly at me and smiles then continues. Mr. Watson, I have had a team of accountants looking at your finances, and they tell me your submission is correct. I on the other hand know that you're an intelligent man, and I think you have more than you are declaring but cannot prove it. Therefore, I find that Mrs. Watson has no claim against your house, land or your impending inheritance. You will however pay for her car lease until it's up when Mrs. Watson will be responsible for her transportation. You will also pay for her insurance up to that time. Mr. Watson as you have the house, and your wife will have to find alternative accommodation, I am awarding her $300k from your joint account and the remainder to you. Mrs. Watson, I am refusing your claim for spousal support, and the same goes for you Mr. Watson. As for you being unemployed, you will have no problem obtaining work with your qualifications. This is my final decision Mr. and Mrs. Watson you are now divorced. And he banged his gavel, he then addressed my ex-wife. Ms. Watson you will now surrender your rings to the bailiff and report next Monday to the court bailiff to serve your sentence. Next case please. As we left the court Sarah's attorney approached mine for a short conversation. Jane came over to me and explained that Sarah wanted to know when she could collect the rest of her stuff. She also asked if she could have a few words with me. I told Jane I would not be home for the next three days, so Sarah could take anything she wanted to start her new life. And I would meet Sarah for coffee at our local deli at 4 this evening. Jane went over to Sarah's attorney and gave him my answer. Sarah looked over at me and mouthed thank you then left. I went home and packed for a week away. I was going to the lake where I had hired a little fishing cabin. I arrived at the deli at exactly 4 pm and went in, Sarah was sitting at our favorite booth with coffees waiting. I sat down opposite her. I noticed she had made an effort to look nice and started the conversation. Okay, Sarah you wanted this talk so talk. I just wanted to explain I stopped her short. Sarah there's nothing to explain. You told me you were no longer interested in sex and that I was a pervert and not to touch you. I respected your wishes and moved into the guest room. Three months later you jumped into bed with another man completely disrespecting me and your family. Okay if you had come to me and said you no longer love me and wanted a divorce. I would have been devastated but would have understood. Instead, you deceived me for almost a year and connived to take as much of the money I earned as possible. I don't see a stalking will make any of that go away or be less painful for me. I love you unconditionally for over 20 years and you sheet on our whole life together for what a lying cheating bigamous murder. You have three days to take whatever you want, and what you leave goes to the charity shop including the furniture. I can't stand to be in the house so full of happy memories you destroyed. Do you know that when I first found out about your affair I thought about putting a gun in my mouth to stop the pain. The only thing that stopped me was I couldn't hurt the children that way. Talking of the children they know everything and are not happy so good luck with them. Sarah was now sobbing. I threw a house key on the table and left. I went straight to Wendy's apartment where she was waiting for me with a bag packed. How did it go? About as well as I expected. I then told her the whole story from when the judge called our case to me leaving Sarah in the deli. We drove the two hours to the cabin, it was nearly dark when we arrived, so I pulled up as close to the front porch as possible. I opened up and let some fresh air in as it didn't look as if it had been used for some time. I collected the bags from the car, and Wendy made some coffee and sandwiches with the food we brought with us. I went to see which was the biggest bedroom so as to put Wendy's bags in when I realized there was only one bedroom. I looked at Wendy like a guilty child. Oh god, Wendy I'm so sorry I didn't realize when I booked that it only had one bedroom, I promise it wasn't planned. I'll sleep on the couch tonight and take you home in the morning. Remind me, Bill you were divorced this morning right? Yes of course you know I was. So, what's the problem or don't you want to make love to me? You know I do but I hadn't planned it I thought I would wait until you were ready. Bill, I've been ready for weeks I've been waiting for your divorce to come through, and now that it has, get naked and on the bed. Sarah. Bill left me crying on my own. I picked up the key and went out to my car, I sat in the car sobbing. I thought why am I crying? It's all my fault I thought I could trade up and ended up with nothing. I went to the house which now seemed empty and cold, I started looking around at the familiar surroundings that I had loved so much. Bill said I could take whatever I wanted, but first I had to find somewhere to live. I looked in the local papers for somewhere to rent, and found an advert for a rented condos not far from the hospital. I called the agent and arranged a meeting for the next morning. I looked at the furniture and wondered how big the condo would be and what I should take. I decided to leave that for after I had seen the condo. I went upstairs to the bedroom that I had not shared with Bill for over a year. It looked so sad and empty I pulled down a suitcase and started loading my clothes into it. 
I soon realized I would need more than one suitcase. I had hardly made a dent in my wardrobe, and the case was full. I went into the garage and found the boxes we had moved Anne's stuff into her dorm and took them upstairs. As I was clearing out the bottom of my wardrobe I found a box marked keep. I knew what was in there, it was all the little keepsakes we had accumulated over the years. I opened the box and there were over 20 years of memories staring back at me. I started to pick through them. There was a photo of us as a couple before we were married, we looked so happy. There were little mementos of our time together and holidays we had taken with the children. At the bottom, I found the top of our wedding cake decoration, a bride and groom holding each other. I sat there looking at our happy past for I don't know how long, then realized the decoration I was holding was getting wet. I then realized tears were dripping off of my nose and soaking the bed. I think I now realized the hurt I had caused my husband, the best man I had ever known. I know that if I had known the combination of Bill's gun safe, I would have ended it all right there and then. I suddenly realized I was hungry so ordered some pizza to be delivered and poured myself some wine. There was a knock on the door, and when I looked through the peephole it was the pizza being delivered. I put the TV on just for some background noise while I ate the pizza and drank my wine. As I sat there I realized how quiet and empty the house felt without Bill there. Even though we were not sleeping in the same room I was comforted by the knowledge that he was there. I went up to bed but couldn't sleep even though I was dog tired. I walked down the corridor to Bill's room and just stood there looking at his bed. I know it was stupid of me to think this way, but I missed him so badly, I got into his bed and could smell his manliness on his pillow, I eventually cried myself to sleep. In the morning I showered, dressed and resumed my packing. I was putting my life in cardboard boxes ready to leave my home of over 20 years. To say I was sad was an understatement. I kept my appointment with the real estate agent and looked over the condo. It only had one bedroom, but that was all I could afford on my salary. I didn't think I would see much of my family. They had made it quite clear they wanted nothing to do with me, and I was not to phone them. The condo was completely empty of furniture, and I guessed I could fit about half of the furniture from the house in it. I decided that as Bill didn't want anything from the house I would put the rest into storage. I paid three months rent on the condo and signed the lease. I will move in on Friday. I contacted a removal company straight away and made the arrangements. I now had two days to pack everything up. I stopped on the way home for something to eat as I had missed breakfast. When I got back to the house, it was no longer home, so I resumed packing. When I got to the bedrooms I decided to take all the bed linen and deliberately put the pillow I had cuddled up to last night in a plastic bag. I wanted to smell Bill for as long as the odor lasted. Friday came all too quickly, but I was ready, the moving truck arrived on time, and by late afternoon I was unpacking in my new home. I tried to contact Bill on several occasions with no success. Monday I had to report to the courthouse to start the 30-day sentence. I had packed a bag with just some underwear and toiletries. When I arrived and reported in I was put in a room with three other women, all en route to the county lockup for similar offenses. We were put in a caged bus and off we went, it was a three hour drive, and we all needed to pee when we got there. It wasn't what I had expected. There were no watchtowers and armed guards, just some tough looking female guards. We were shown into a small hall and told it was the mess hall. We were then given the welcome speech. Basically, we would be split into three working groups. One for the kitchen, one for cleaning the prison, and one for doing community work outside. We shared a room with one other inmate. The room wasn't a cell and even had a small TV. It wasn't locked at night, but there was a curfew and lights out at 10 p.m. I was assigned community service and as I was a nurse, I was put to work in the local community clinic run by volunteers. I quite liked my job and looked forward to going to the clinic every day but Sunday. We were allowed visitors on Sunday and they could stay for lunch, and we were allowed to wear normal clothing instead of our overalls. This was so that any children visiting would not be alarmed at the state of the woman they were visiting. We even had picnic tables in the grassed over exercise yard, so that families could connect. All in all, not a bad place to spend pissing off a judge. When my roommate asked why I didn't get any visitors I told her everything through tear-filled eyes. She told everyone else, and my nickname was Dipsheet. They called me that for what I had thrown away. Most of the inmates were of lower financial standing, and would have given anything to have had my life. While I was there I did have two visitors, one from the FBI and the other from the DA's office. I was asked by the FBI agent if I was willing to testify against Carl and of course, I agreed. The DA was there to tell me I was to be charged with conspiracy to defraud, but if I agreed to testify against Carl, it would help my case again I agreed. By now I had opened my eyes to what Carl really was and despised both him and me for what I had done. The 30 days were done, and I returned to my condo and my life as it was. When I reported for work that week I was told that no doctor in the or would work with me. 
The hospital couldn't fire me as Bill had agreed not to sue the hospital for their part in ruining my marriage. In exchange they would keep me on at the same rate but as a full-time nurse. I was to be transferred to general nursing on a three-shift system. I wondered why Bill would do this for me and thank my lucky stars I had married such a wonderful man. Bill? Our three-day stay at the cabin had to eventually end and yes we did actually get some fishing done. I had rented a small furnished apartment as I didn't want Wendy to think I expected to stay with her. She quickly shot that down insisting I move in with her, so I did. I wondered how Sarah was getting on in the county jail. I had been thinking about her and our children, and how I would look if I burned her to the ground, so I decided to help her out. I must admit this stuck in my throat, but I wanted a good relationship with my kids and for them to accept Wendy. I spoke to Jane about my concerns, and we devised a plan. I would sue the hospital for failing to enforce the morality clause in my wife's and Sheethead's contract. If they agreed to my proposal I would withdraw my claim and sign a non-disclosure agreement. My demand was that she be retained as a full-time nurse on her full salary without sanctions. This way she would be able to support herself and live a normal life, thus keeping my children happy. For the next few months, I was busy selling the house and land to a developer on the condition that he demolished my old house and built me a new house on the banks of the river. I would retain 5 acres of riverfront acreage, and the water rights would remain mine. Sarah and I spent hours looking over designs for our new house, before we decided we wanted a large house, so that we could have all the children stay for Thanksgiving and Christmas. We were also hoping for grandchildren in the future. Three months went by before Dr. Sheethead's trial, my wife gave evidence as did his other victims. He got seven years for fraudulently obtaining money from five women, and conspiracy to defraud me and my wife. My wife was charged with conspiracy to defraud and sentenced to two years suspended with 200 hours of community service. Sheethead was then handed over to the feds and tried for murder. The trial lasted less than a week, and he was sentenced to 30 years in the state penitentiary. Epilogue Bill and Wendy moved into their new house, and Bill's children were regular visitors. Anne never spoke about her mother and didn't keep in touch with her, but Mark and Sarah were mending fences. Mark told Bill his mother lived alone and never dated and often asked about Bill, he said she was truly sorry about the whole episode. Although Bill and Wendy were happy but something was missing, the house was too quiet for just two people. After some discussion, they decided to adopt. They wanted to adopt two teenagers. At their age, small children would be too much to handle long term. So, they contacted various agencies to find what they wanted. They eventually adopted a brother and sister orphan when their parents were killed in an auto accident. Kevin was 14 and Tracy was coming up to her 13th birthday. At first, it was hard for them to adjust to new parents. To help them settle in, Bill and Wendy insisted that a photo of their parents be displayed prominently in the family room. They told the children they didn't expect to be called mom and dad, but Wendy and Bill, this seemed to calm the children and settle them down. They soon settled into their new routine and got on well with their new siblings. When Christmas two years later Kevin and Tracy asked if they could call Bill and Wendy, mom and dad from now on. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. Sarah. Sarah continued to work in the hospital eventually being promoted to head nurse. She never married again and rarely dated, she kept Bill's pillow on her bed, although his smell had long faded. She kept in touch with Mark and through him followed Bill's life. She often cried herself to sleep for what she had thrown away so selfishly. She still keeps a picture of Bill with the kids, and now grandchildren on her bedside table, and kisses it each night before going to sleep. The asshole. Carl was put into a cell with Bubba for four years before he was found dead in the showers for biting another inmate's clock whilst being gang raped. Life's choices can be tough, and sometimes, the consequences are even tougher. Until our next journey, take care, reflect on the moments that matter, and stay tuned for more stories right here. See you soon.